Lauren is here. She's uh, she's here. Yeah, there she is. She's coming here. Yeah. Yes. So when everybody's here, I'll explain, and I think I'll explain it to the audience as well. So are we in, are we in the order you want us to be? Or um, is that okay? Catherine, Derby, Laura, and Laura can be there, and then yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we'll come. in the microphone like like as if it was on it's not on but so that people can hear online we need it on yeah because normally i leave one for the audience but maybe I'll, we'll leave both right now and then i'll take it down myself okay so i will just introduce welcome everyone back and introduce anna leary and Hello everyone, welcome back. We're happy to have you here. Yes, the microphone is only a prop inside this theater space, uh, but it is actually being used for our live streaming. So the, that folks, whoever's tuning in, can hear us, we will be speaking into the mic. So uh, we will make it available to the audience when we have audience ask questions. So I'll stand next to Mark over there and I'll hold the mic. And so please come up and ask questions at, at the microphone. Uh, so let's get started. Thank you for coming back. Uh, I'm happy, so honored to have this panel here today. I'm very excited to have our esteemed panelists and our moderator, Anna O'Leary, Dr. Anna O'Leary, head of the MAS department at Arizona State, uh, at University of Arizona. <gasps> I can't believe I just said that! Oh my God, I'm so sorry. We had a professor from that other school in the audience, and yes, I am so sorry. Of course, the University of Arizona. <laughs> Thank you, Milta, and thank you very much, everybody, for attending uh, today's event. I'm very happy and very proud to be here. I'm very honored uh, to have been asked to come and moderate this panel. So my role is to uh, help with questions, introduce the panelists, and uh, try to keep us into uh, a, an important dialogue that we, that we will have in response to the play that we just all saw. Um, so uh, we have uh, four panelists, and uh, we have Catherine Gaffney to my left uh, from No More Deaths. Uh, we have Debbie McCullough from Tucson Samaritans. Uh, we have Laura Bellos from Florence Immigration, Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project. And we have Rocio Calderon uh, from the Casa Mariposa Detention Visitation Program and Cecilia Valenzuela G from the same program who will help translate uh, some of Rocio's comments. So again, thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'm going to ask the panelists to take just uh, two to three minutes uh, to explain to our, the audience uh, their work or involvement in these organizations uh, and perhaps just uh, connect with what we witnessed here today uh, in the play. Um, and we'll just go ahead and once we get to the, uh, the four panelists, then we will open this up for uh, discussion and we will welcome questions, your thoughts and comments uh, at the end of our uh, introductions. So we'll start with, with Catherine first. Um, so my name is Catherine Gaffney. I've been a volunteer with No More Deaths since 2009. Uh, no More Deaths is a humanitarian aid organization based in Southern Arizona. 
Our mission is to end the death and suffering of migrants and refugees crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and so we have a bunch of different projects uh, that attempt to do that. Many people might know about the, um, our Desert Aid Project, where we go out and put water gallons and food um, on the migrant trails that cross through the desert. And we also give first aid uh, medical assistance to, to people we meet in distress. Um, and then we do a bunch of work on the Mexican side in different shelters, assisting with uh, phone calls, first aid, uh, documentation of abuses by people coming out of Border Patrol custody. We also uh, are part of the, uh, the Keep Tucson Together Legal Clinic, based in uh, b which uh, meets every week in Tucson, does free legal assistance, trying to stop people's deportation so that we can uh, prevent people from having to cross through the desert by getting them relief before that happens. And um, we also do abuse documentation. And unfortunately, <coughs> most recently, we've been waging a legal defense campaign for our nine volunteers who have been federally indicted for felony and misdemeanor counts, all related to giving humanitarian aid to folks crossing. Um, and it's, very, it's a very direct connection with the sanctuary movement and with everything we saw tonight. Uh, our, the founders of No More Deaths are also some of the founders of the sanctuary movement. And uh, I would say watching the play, so many of the debates um, that Milta and Mark brought alive that were uh, internal to the sanctuary movement are still very much internal to No More Deaths, debates about tactics and privilege and legalities and, and how, to, how to make change. So I think it's, um, it all feels very fresh. Thank you, Catherine. I'm Debbie McCullough with the Tucson Samaritans. Very much like No More Deaths, um, we go into the desert, we send a team into the desert every day. We start out, Southside Church is our um, home, and we go out with um, water, medical supplies, and food, walking the trails, um, looking for people who are lost and left behind. I think one of the, um, uh, uh, you know, our operating principle is to be a helping hand in the desert um, in any way that we possibly can. The situation that we face right now is that so for so many years that you hear this, oh, the number of people crossing is dropping, the Border Patrol's out there. W you know, we encounter people just about every week. There's a, there is an encounter. There are people out there, and this year there were 122 deaths in the desert. So the deaths are not dropping significantly as the number of people crossing drops the number of deaths are staying about the same um, proportionately. So it's, it's still very shocking, and the work needs to go on, both through No More Deaths and through Samaritans, so however um, we can go forward. I do want to bring up one more thing that, in terms of what's different, um, right now, in the last few weeks, uh, certainly it's become a little more uh, known among our uh, groups that there is a militia group in uh, the town of Aravaca that is really um, causing a great deal of concern to the, to the residents of Aravaca. So a way of being involved if you can't hike trails or really participate in any active way uh, in terms of hiking or walking, drive to Aravaca, just be around, be witnesses to this um, group that's out there bringing a lot of fear to people. And I can go into that with more detail when we, get when we go a little further. So I pass you on to the Florence Project. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Bellows. I'm an attorney with the Florence Project. And the Florence Project was born about 30 years ago, right about the same time that the events in the play were happening. Um, it was started up in Florence, the uh, prison town about halfway between here and, and Phoenix, in response to a lot of the Central American refugees who were fleeing um, from that violence. Um, there are immigration detention centers there in Florence as well as in Eloy. And as you may may or may not know, there's no right to counsel in immigration removal proceedings. So if you are detained and you are uh, trying to fight an asylum case, you don't have the right to a public defender. So the Florence Project is really the only uh, free legal services provider that um, serves detained men, women, and children in the state of Arizona. So we, gr we started about 30 years ago providing um, very minimal services and then grew from there. And now we have a staff of about 75, and we serve uh, detained minors as well. I work specifically with detained minors here in Tucson, <coughs> unaccompanied kids who have crossed the border by themselves. Um, and, and we saw this summer how that population shifted from unaccompanied kids 
to kids who were separated from their parents. So <coughs> um, a lot of the themes that go across the play in terms of Central Americans fleeing from violence as well as families trying to stay together really are, are very much um, current and we see them playing out on a daily basis in our work. Um, we are glad to be uh, witnesses to this work and to be fighting against deportation cases on an individual basis. And we also do our best to raise these cases um, to national attention in the media as well, so that way these stories are told on a broader scale. Thanks. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Rocío Calderón. Good afternoon, my name is Rocío Calderón. Vengo en representación de Casa Mariposa. I am representing Casa Mariposa. Casa Mariposa es una organización eh, de voluntarios. It's an organization of volunteers. Es un programa de voluntarios que hacen visitas al centro de detención de Eloy. And these volunteers do visitations at Eloy Detention Center. Tratamos de, eh, de no, que no siga el aislamiento con las personas. We try to break the isolation that the, these people feel over there. Les brindamos amistad. We bring them friendship. Apoyo. Support. Espiritual. Emocional. Both spiritual support and emotional support too. Y en algunos casos económico, and pagando fianzas. In some cases, uh, economical support. We sometimes get involved with the paying of bonds. El programa se mantiene gracias al apoyo de la comunidad. And this program is, is uh, kept through the contributions and support of the community. Juntamente con el proyecto Florence. Together with the Florence Project. La iglesia de Shalom Menonita and the Church of Shalom Mennonite y otros miembros de la comunidad and other members of the community. Eh, para mí es una bendición estar en este lugar. To me, it's, this is a, a, a blessing to be in this place y poder hacer lo que hicieron por mí. And be able to participate like what they did to me. Eh, yo estuve dos años en el centro de detención. I was two years in this center of detention. Y Casa Mariposa me brindó mucho apoyo. And Casa Mariposa gave me so much support. No me dejó sola, estuvo conmigo en mi lucha, en mi pelea. It wouldn't leave me alone and it accompanied me in my fight, in my struggle. Hasta que gané mi caso. Until I won my case. Y aún así siguen a mi lado. And even now, they continue on my side. Y con ese ejemplo, yo estoy siguiendo y haciendo lo mismo por las personas en el centro de detención. And with that example, I do the same thing, and I go to the same detention center to help other people. Porque en ese tiempo que he estado, vi la necesidad. In that time that I was there, I saw the need. Y el significado de una visita. And the meaning of one visit es, es muy emocionante que alguien que tú no conoces vaya a visitarte o te escriba una carta. It's, it's very emotional to know that somebody that doesn't know you can come and visit you or write you a letter. O cuando vas a las visitas y te dan un abrazo. Or when you go to the visits and, um, and they give you a hug. Una palabra de aliento tiene mucho significado. One word of um, support has a lot, a lot of meaning. Eso es lo que tengo para ustedes. Thank you. My name is Cecilia Valenzuela G, and I'm also a visitor at uh, Ile, um, Eloy Detention Center. I am originally from Chile, and um, I, what I wanted to say is um, something I, I wrote, something just uh, to talk about hope a little bit, which is a, a topic and a theme that, we, that touches me a lot when I go there. I started visiting Eloy because I wanted to 
be involved with the children in the schools whose parents were um, deported and they were alone. I, I used to teach uh, bilingual education at Davis Bilingual School and they had many families there and they kept asking us what to do about this situation. And so I started going to Casa Mariposa and I encountered this issue of hope a lot and it has been a theme for me. Um, so I'm going to read some, a little bit that I wrote, it's very short. In the gap between fear and the unknown, which these people feel all the time, hope lives and when we arrive, we also embrace it. Hope becomes, as the book Wanning says, not just for the future, but it's alive today. A defiant living hope. Not a fleeting emotional reaction to fear, but an audacious act. That's when our hearts meet. We sit next to the other person, looking into each other's eyes across the wooden table, listening with live ears, sharing the present moment, and we together feel the dance of hope, at least for a moment. And that is a gift for us, the visitors of Casa Mariposa, the true gift of shared humanity, a vulnerable and also transformative. Uh, well, thank you, Catherine, Debbie, Laura, Rocio, and Cecilia. And so we would like to open up uh, to the audience uh, questions, comments, either directly to anyone in particular or the panel in general. Uh, you've seen a, 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 a play such as this, I'm sure, uh, might cause some anxiety, um, you know, concerns and I think this is a, a good way to process a lot of the information that we saw and we have a panel of experts uh, that might be able to shed light um, in terms of our concerns and our questions. So with that I'd like to see if there are any uh, questions out there uh, of anybody who would like to ask of the panel or make a commentary um, with respect to the play or the work of the panelists. Something that some people might want to think about is, uh, you know, it was mentioned when the panelists just mentioned a while ago that we have a current situation in our borders with more, uh, more detention, uh, especially women and children. And so we are at a, perhaps another crossroad in this historical development and uh, I would maybe ask if you have any comments or observations in terms of how different or in what way um, is, is this a worse times or, or different times and, and what in terms of c the community we might expect in terms of responding to what we're s currently seeing, the crisis on the border. Uh, yes, Ms. What would you attribute uh, the fact that there are more deaths and less people crossing? Um, oh, so the question was to what do we attribute the fact that there's more deaths even though there uh, has been a decrease in people crossing. Um, that really goes back to the Border Patrol strategy of prevention through deterrence, which has been in place for 20 years, which is basically the idea that if you make crossing, if you make the act of crossing the border so miserable and so deadly, um, it will deter people from attempting. And what we know is that that's not true because people have life or death reasons that they're undertaking this journey to begin with. So rather than deterring anyone, what it does is cause increased deaths. And even in my time in the last nine years uh, working with No More Deaths, I've seen a massive increase of military-style uh, border enforcement um, in Aravaca. I've seen the way uh, towers and helicopters and ATVs, I mean, any kind of military technology you can think of is being deployed on the border by the Border Patrol. And um, what that does is shift people into the most dangerous parts um, of the desert. 
and um, and makes the journey longer and longer. Also through uh, checkpoints, which you know formally and and even in the days of sanctuary, as you can see in the play, um, they folks were to, to get in the country. Folks were crossing the line, but then driving to Tucson. And now there's a system of checkpoints that would make that effectively impossible because you have to walk anywhere from 30 to 80 miles before you could get past the checkpoints and get into a car. So that's obviously a, a really big difference. I just wanted to add that the other thing that has changed over the last several years as that number has decreased is the situation on the Mexican side of the border. It used to be that they were brought right to the border and began their journey there. Now people will walk more than, often more than two or three days to get to the border to begin their journey. And people are taking the, um, in the early 2000s when um, people crossed and the, the Devil's Highway was written by Luis Orea, because of the horrors of the death in the far um, western end of our state, the um, people stopped that using that section. Now, where the students were, uh, where the young No More Deaths people were arrested was in that area because people are, are going through that and it is extremely deadly. So they're taking more and more, more risks because of the militarization of the border. I'm just interested in hearing any um, updates that the kids have or that any any updates there might be with the parents and the kids um, situation. Also, is there a way that you could speak up a little bit more so the folks in the back can hear you? Yeah, thank sure. you. So the, the question was if there's any kind of update on um, family separation and the status of kids and families and, and reuniting those families. Um, sure, so the, the vast majority of kids and parents thankfully have been reunified thanks to um, Judge Sabra's order that came out of the California District Court in a <coughs> uh, an ACLU lawsuit. Um, there are still a number of children who have not been reunified with their parents and those are the cases that are the most troubling and the most worrisome. Um, I think that that the government executed this, I wouldn't even call it a plan, I, they executed this mess without any kind of tracking system or without any kind of way for parents to know where their children were or for children to know where their parents were. So there are a number of kids who are still in, in detention either because their parents have been deported already and we definitely saw parents who were saying, in Eloy and Florence, they were saying, the government has told me that the only way I'm gonna see my child again is to sign this, this paper, agreeing to waive my right to, to fight for asylum and take a deportation. So a number of parents have been deported. And then the government um, has also said that a number of parents are ineligible. Um, and some of them are because parents have abused or abandoned or neglected their children them in, in some cases, but in another, a number of other cases, it's because of something very old and very minor. So an old conviction for assault that had nothing to do with child abuse or other kinds of criminal activity um, that would certainly not prejudice uh, any of us who are parents um, and having our custodial rights being taken away. But in these cases, the government has said because of those um, old convictions or old reports, those parents are ineligible. So we are still working with a number of kids who are separated from their parents. And we are still working with a number of parents who have been separated from their children. But thankfully, most of them have been reunified. Is there another question out there? I, oh, there's one on, over here. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about um, um, the um, being in Eloy or Florence in one of the detention centers, um, and since I was uh, participating in the visitation program, uh, the, the question is directed to Rocio. Uh, with uh, some people find it so incredibly difficult to stay there that when they are eligible to um, 
to either continue staying in the, deto in the detention center or willingly be deported, they will be deported because they cannot tolerate uh, staying in the centers any longer. How did you survive for two years without going mad? A un principio quería escaparme, yo pensé que no podía aguantar. In the beginning, I thought I wanted to escape. I didn't think I could take this. Pero también alrededor me di cuenta que habían personas como yo, eran mamás, eran hijas. But I looked around and I saw other people that were also mothers, they were daughters. No eran delincuentes los que estaban ahí conmigo. They were not delinquents, the people that were there with me. Y ellas mismas me, me dieron las fuerzas para pelear mi caso, porque yo tenía una verdad por la que tenía que, que pelear. And they were the ones who gave me the strength to fight my case. I knew I had a truth behind my case. Fue una decisión muy dura porque mis hijas estaban en Bolivia. It was a very difficult decision because my daughters were in Bolivia. Uh, me comuniqué con ellas. I contacted them. Y ellas me apoyaron. Me dijeron, mami, Sigue adelante, nosotros te vamos a apoyar. They gave me their support. They said, Mami, uh, we continue ahead. We are going to give you support. Y eso me dio la fortaleza. That gave me strength. A un principio me sentía sola porque decía, no tengo abogado, no conozco a nadie, pero... In the beginning I felt so lonely. I didn't have a lawyer and I didn't know anybody. Y conocí a Casa Mariposa. And then I met Casa Mariposa. Y a Proyecto Florence. And the, pr the Florence Project. Ellos me dieron las fuerzas para seguir luchando mi caso. They gave me the strength also to continue to fight my case. Y también mi fe. Also my faith. Siempre mantuve mi fe y mi esperanza. I was always able to keep my faith and, and the hope. Y traté de sobrellevar ese tiempo haciendo algo útil. I tried to pass that time doing something uh, useful. Traté de transmitir a las otras personas la paz que sentí yo. I tried to transmit to other people the peace that I was feeling inside. Porque recibí la paz que Dios me dio because I felt peace from God who gave me that peace. Y eso es lo que ahora me, me motiva That's my motivation now para seguir ayudando a esas personas to keep helping those people porque sé que es necesario y, y es algo muy, muy um, humanitario. Because I know it's very needed and it's humanitarian. What happens to the children who, whose parents are deemed um, unfit? What, what is going to happen to those children? It's a, it's a very good question. The question is what happens to the children whose parents are, are deemed um, unable to reunify with those children? Um, I, I don't know. I think that it's extremely concerning to us um, because the government has, if, if they can't reunify with those parents, the government has essentially created um, orphans within the United States. Um, those, a lot of the kids that are still detained um, have ways to fight a legal case, but the question is who's going to take care of them? And even though they might have extended family here in the United States, that's not a parent, and there's no basis for taking that child away from that parent 
other than the government's decision to separate those um, those families, the the lawsuit that's going um, through the California court system, there is a proposed settlement that might give some parents the ability to fight again a case for deportation if they can show that they were coerced into um, leaving the country. But I think that's still very much an open question that's very, very worrying to a lot of us. Um, oh, there's, okay, good. And then in, in front, we'll make sure details, but just off of that question, in the foster care system here, if a parent is TPR'd or ter uh, terminates parental rights, then those children are put up for adoption. Is that what's going to happen with these children? I, I So the question is, um, w is there a possibility that these parents who have been deported or have deemed ineligible could face a severance of parental rights? I, d I don't know. Um, I think that there's still a lot that, that remains to be settled. I think that there's a small number of those children who perhaps their parents are unable to parent them and the, the child is afraid of returning to that parent. But I think in the majority of those cases that we saw this summer, it was a family unit that was coming together. Um, so I think that's still very much waiting to be settled. I know Texas had proposed an amendment to its um, the bases that it has for severance and saying that the, the detention of a parent is not a, a basis for, for severance. I don't think we have anything similar here, um, but I think uh, there's still so much uncertainty it, with regard to what will happen to these children that that's still a, a bit down the road. Um, but I think it really is a result. The uncertainty is, is certainly a result of the lack of any kind of planning that went into the execution of this plan. Um, and the kids and the parents are, are truly the ones who have suffered as a result. I recently met some women in Nogales at the Commodore that had been deported from Florence and they asked if I could share what happened to them because they thought if more people know maybe something could help. But they said the most humiliating thing that happened to them was being strip searched when they were brought in and the other thing is when they were released is that they weren't given any of their things back and they were giving none of their money back and they were given tickets to Puebla and they lived in Guerrero. And they said, how are we supposed to get home? And uh, all I could think of is that it's part of the deterrence. Is that how they, if they go back and tell them, this is how they're gonna treat you, maybe their friends won't come. That's a question. Um, for children, family, in detention. Um, I know that for some of the children, um, education, some educational opportunities are being offered, but that for others, that's not the case. And I wondered if you had any updates on that, and also who is delivering it for, for those, those children who are um, going to some kind of school experience um, that service. So the question is, uh, who provides school for detained kids? Uh, if, they, if a child um, enters as an unaccompanied child and also in the family separation um, is separated from a, a parent, um, they're generally placed with the Office of Refugee Resettlement and then in, in smaller shelters. And the shelter provides schooling for those kids. Um, it's certainly not um, a system where they are earning credits toward a diploma. Um, but the, it, there is schooling provided within the shelters. I have, I have to share that TUSD is working with Southwest Key Facility to provide education for those children. I understand that they are 12 and older and uh, it will be uh, happening in one of the empty schools right now. The board has to vote finally for that, but that conversation has been going on. It's pretty serious. Um, so I would like to take just a point of privilege for just uh, to ask a question of the panelists um, and maybe food for thought for the audience. 
in thinking or reflecting on the sanctuary play and that historical development, um, what you know, what has changed in our world? Uh, is another sanctuary type of movement possible? Is is people who are coming to the border? You know, it's it's different. It's uh, there's it's the context of the 1980s was the wars in Central America and U.S. intervention, which created that those bloody wars, um, and we've moved beyond that, and now women and children coming to the borders are uh, primarily saying that they are trying to flee the violence caused by gang violence, some of which w we as, as a country is responsible for uh, by sending deportees who hadn't had a chance in the United States. Uh, so I don't know if, if if we are at a moment where we have to decide, people of conscience decide as to what type of underground railroad exists, if in fact is that possible, uh, what are the circumstances that would keep us from doing something of that nature, or m maybe it's just not possible. So I, I, I'll throw that question out there for the audience to think about and also invite a panelist, our panelists to maybe shed some light or uh, some of their some of their observations in terms of our current situation of migrants from Central America fleeing uh, their places of origin to come to the United States. It was only a few years ago when we had Rosa Robles here at Southside and that sanctuary uh, event was very public and the publicity really helped us. But now we cannot go that way. This, the government right now is, has increased, I don't know what word to use, but um, the oppression is so much more dangerous that it's underground. It is an underground type of thing. We have this, this uh, Southern Arizona Sanctuary Coalition in place right now, organizing many, many churches that have people in sanctuary. And these people are um, in hiding right now. And that is the only solution right now that I, that I know that is, it's, is viable at this point because of the danger of uh, the situation right now. Um, no More Death sponsors Keep Tucson together. The, the legal clinic that Margot Cowan, who was, I'm not sure which, I mean, I can't remember the character. Oh, she was Carol in the play. Um, she continues her amazing work. Um, and it is a free clinic, legal clinic. We have I don't know, hundreds of clients right now. And we need volunteer lawyers, we need volunteers. It reminded me that the, the play was so familiar because when I started volunteering there, it was, okay, I'll do this real easily. You know, now it's, now I'm pretty much a, this is, this could absorb my whole life. Uh, because of the need and the, um, you know, the bonding out of people who, the bonds can be phenomenal, $16,000 for a family, you know, the everything that um, courts started out saying a $1,500 bond would be the maximum if for a poor family, and then the, the Trump administration knocks that down. So it feels like, as Margot said to me the other day, it feels like we're trying these cases in um, Sessions' living room, <laughs> because every time we bring up something, something else is countered. <laughs> but as Cecilia said, we have to maintain hope because we are the, you know, we're the front lines here and it is so empowering to the people that, that we work with to, um, to have that moment where somebody cares enough to come out every Thursday night at Pueblo High School, the first and third Saturday of the month um, here at, at Southside Church just to be a presence in their lives to say, hey, we care enough, we're gonna accompany you through this horror and hope that the political situation changes at the next election. So if anyone's interested in um, helping out with that, where would they go to find out more? So um, they, we have a, a 
Keep Tucson together. You can come to Pueblo High School every Thursday night at 5.30 and um, just say you want to volunteer. We'll find a place. You can, you can shadow people for several weeks. Um, we'll find a place. You don't have to be a Spanish speaker. If you are, that's very helpful, but you don't have to be a Spanish speaker. So the, any Thursday night, you can also... Um, no More Deaths, or uh, there's a web, uh, there's a Facebook page for Keep Tucson Together. You can contact No More Deaths. You can contact Tucson Samaritans. Um, the other part is you can um, just come here to Southside Church, the first and the third Saturday of the month. There's a training on October 20th. Um, that'll be at noon, October 20th. There's a training for um, here in the church. I was just going to... Uh, before we get to the next question, I think this is a really interesting moment thinking about um, political strategies of visibility and publicity. And I think it's really interesting that the sanctuary play starts with the movement being underground and then we see the decision to go public. Um, and No More Deaths was always public. I mean, we started, w how, although border residents have been giving humanitarian aid since the beginning of the border crisis. No More Deaths was always public and above ground. And what we've seen in the last year under Trump is uh, last June, Bird Camp, which was our sanctuary in Aravaca, was raided by uh, 25 Border Patrol agents who took away uh, migrants receiving uh, medical care. And, um, and now, not only are they arresting people that we are very publicly trying to help, but they're also going after our volunteers. And I think it's interesting because I don't know if the right response is to become less public or not. I think that's really up for debate. Um, I think what's different under Trump is while these policies that are targeting undocumented people have been in place for a long time and uh, were very strong under Obama, Trump seems very willing to go after the activists. Um, but the downside of going after activists is that they're activists, so they're going to speak up and fight back, right? Um, so we'll see. You know, I think we'll see where it goes. But uh, it, so much of, I think, the undocumented movement in America, too, has been around politics of visibility, has been undocumented, unafraid. And I think this is just a moment where that's really challenged. Um, but I also wanted to put in a small plug ar around uh, the question of visibility. We're handing out yard signs uh, that say humanitarian aid is never a crime. We're trying to get those plastered up all around Tucson so that uh, the judge and the jury and the prosecutors who are going after volunteers know that the, this entire community stands with the values that everyone deserves food and water, everyone deserves care, uh, medical care when they're in distress, and that doesn't matter what your paperwork is. That's a shared value. So um, we did, uh, there are still some outside, probably people didn't want to take them on their way in and sit with them, but they're free and please take one and put one in your yard. Um, the trials are gonna be coming up in November and December possibly, so we really want to get that community value out in public right now, it's very important. So I To, um, to foster participation at whatever level and in whatever form that could happen. I think, I think it's a great question. 
I think that um, my question for anyone running for federal office, because uh, they are the ones who get to call the shots in terms of immigration decisions, is do they support the right of asylum seekers to come to the United States and pursue their claims, especially without having the coercive factor of immigration detention? And as Rocio so um, eloquently discussed, this detention, being detained, is a force that pushes against you every day. And we see clients give up on their right to fight asylum because they have other things that, that demand their time. They have families. They can't be detained for that long. So I think pushing against the criminalization of asylum seekers and demanding that those people have the right to pursue their claims while not being held in federal detention is, is extremely important. I want to just put a little plug in also for all of our community members who are in detention who are not seeking asylum. We have many of our clients are people who have been here for 10, 15, 20 years, some since they were three months old and now they're in their 40s. They're being held, they're being picked up for uh, tinted windshields, um, things hanging from their, uh, what do you call it, their rear view mirrors. And those are, the, those are some of the people that we work with um, trying to get their deportations uh, canceled. And under Obama, the, if they didn't have a long court record, they, they were canceled. Rose's case was closed. That's not happening, and Session has said that everyone who has a closed case should be reopened just mm. automatically. So although the, heart, the, the asylum situation is heartbreaking, we are u losing members of our own community. And could I just add to that, uh, that although, you know, immigration and refugee status has always been under the purview of the federal government, what we've seen since 2005, 2006, lots of state houses uh, propose and pass anti-immigrant laws, and also uh, municipalities as well. So, uh, so we can support those uh, leaders at the municipal, county level, uh, city level, state level that are more sympathetic to uh, the immigration issue uh, by supporting them and voting for those particular uh, members of our community, leaders of our community, and uh, also asking some of those local members as to how they might vote or what they think about some of the possibilities of, say, for example, using a 287G program uh, in which local police are involved in the policing of local uh, of local areas. So I think those are, I think we're at a point where federal and state and municipal and county are coming together and being very polarized, but as citizens, I think we have the right to ask of our leaders where they stand on local issues in terms of uh, things that might make it more difficult or, or easy to police immigrants, stopping people suspected of being undocumented uh, because they look, the, they look like undocumented immigrants. So I think those are also important electoral and political actions that we can all take as, as voting, as voting uh, electorate. We have time perhaps for one more question from the audience. A lot of no more deaths. Kind of what that relationship has been like, and what kind of support or opposition you're getting there. Well, one thing to mention uh, following up on this is that we just had a huge victory with the rejection of Operation Stone Garden funds by the Pima County Board of Supervisors for Pima County Sheriff's Department. Um, and I believe it's the first ever uh, example of a county sheriff turning down federal funds that uh, are very generous to the Sheriff's Department but come with the contract that you must enforce immigration. Uh, which which Sheriff Napier has said, uh, you know, I think, and I, I, I apologize if I get any of the local politics wrong, but I think when he ran, he said, no, we want trust from all our community members, documented and undocumented. 
but then to turn around and take these federal funds that are a binding contract to enforce immigration law is really in contradiction of it. So that was a huge victory, and that came from community organizing and a mass and a really effective coalition. So I would say, yeah, get out and vote, but hold the people accountable because otherwise, don't you can't trust them for a minute, right? Um, and then I think the other thing to mention is. Um, no More Deaths and, and other allied groups, in, including Aguilas del Desierto, Armadios Busqueda um, in San Diego, and uh, other groups up and down the border do a lot of search and rescue cases for missing migrants. And generally, uh, you know, we're civilian uh, humanitarian aid groups. We have nothing like the kinds of resources that a sheriff's department would have. Um, but we get missing migrant calls because the Border Patrol unit that those calls get referred to when someone gets lost in the desert has been basically totally ineffective and unwilling to go out and search for people. Um, so unfortunately, we as you know, semi-trained, but basically a ragtag volunteer crew are, go out and do those searches. And there are some uh, county sheriffs that are more cooperative and supportive, but it is really striking. And actually just today I was uh, hiking up to Romero Pools and there's an individual who got sick and needed to be medically evacuated. And I think we saw 10 different uh, cars, probably 15 people show up and get them out. And you don't get that response if you're a migrant. And that's, that's just, I mean, not only is it completely immoral, it, it, should also, it, it is also completely illegal to treat people that unfairly under the law. So I think, um, but it, yeah, and, and I think just the relationship with the sheriff's departments varies by county a bit. It certainly politically varies between Santa Cruz and Cochise and Pima. I don't know if there's I more to add. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a fair yeah. Um, uh, well, I think um, I think if there's uh, nothing more to add, um, in behalf of Borderlands Theater, Mark and Milta, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you very much for your questions, your concern, and just by virtue of you being here as a concerned citizen, I, I think um, I think the struggle, as we all know, is 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 ahead of us. Uh, we're in for the long run, and uh, I think together as a community, as as people of, of good intentions and good heart, we, we'll have to see this through, one way or the other. Thank you very much for coming, uh, and thank you very much for our panelists for their time and for <laughs> this. Thank you very much. Have a great week, everybody.